prompting of some of my younger Word on Fire colleagues, I spent a part of a recent vacation getting caught up on the History Channel program, Vikings, because they had told me that it's the most religious show on television. And I must say, to my surprise, they, they were right. Um, now, don't get me wrong, there's enough pillaging and plundering and swordplay to satisfy the most, you know, macho viewer. But at the same time, Vikings is positively drenched with religion. And for that, I applaud its writers and, and director and producer because it's accurate. I mean, it's, it's true to history. First thing you notice about Vikings is everybody is religious. So all the Northmen and women, uh, all the English, all the French, all the visitors from distant lands, everybody is religious. Now, of course, in different ways, according to different traditions, but everybody has a sense of a transcendent, of, of the divine, of life after death. Everyone embodies this furthermore in ritual and liturgy and procession and practice. And see, this called to my mind uh, Charles Taylor, the great uh, contemporary Catholic philosopher whom I've talked about before. In Taylor's great book on, uh, on modern secularism, he'll say, you know, look, prior to 1500, it was almost unthinkable not to believe in God. Uh, it was simply the default position that, of course, there's a transcendent realm and that my life has meaning in relation to that realm. Now we have what Taylor calls famously the buffered self, where it's, the self is protected from any contact with the transcendent. We all think that this world, this empirically verifiable world, is enough to satisfy our deepest needs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one thing I loved about Vikings was it's just filled with unbuffered selves. I mean, all the selves are open to uh, the transcendent. It was actually a breath of fresh air, to tell you the truth. Here's the second thing about Vikings I thought was really interesting, especially in light of our time. One of its major themes is the clash of religions. So the Vikings go on these early raids to England. When they first come ashore, they're met not by an army, because they come ashore right near the monastery of Lindisfarne, the famous uh, uh, English monastery. And so they're met with monks, these nonviolent uh, figures. The Vikings, of course, come, they conquer the monastery, they carry off all the plunder. But then there's a very intriguing scene. They meet a monk called Athelstan, who emerges as one of the major uh, players in the series. But Athelstan is defending what he takes to be the greatest treasure in the monastery. It's not, you know, candlesticks and gold and all this. He, he clutches to his chest a, a copy of the Gospels. And the Vikings are looking at him like, what does this mean that... Of all the things in the monastery, this man is defending a book? Well, I thought it was a beautiful way <clears throat> to express the primacy of the word in Christianity. Another scene, on a later raid, uh, the Vikings again take over this, uh, not, not um, Lindisfarne, but another monastic community. And Floki, who's one of the major Viking players, and he's kind of a priestly figure among the Vikings. He's very dedicated to Viking religion. They burst in on a mass that's going on, and uh, the priest, you know, leaves the altar, and, and there are the consecrated elements. And Floki picks up the chalice with the consecrated wine, he drinks it, and then he spits it out very dramatically. And then there's this gasp from the crowd. And I thought, boy, it's a beautiful way to convey what the Eucharist meant to the Christians of that time. Indeed, up and down the ages, what the Eucharist means. Um, the, the beautiful realism of it, I thought, was, was uh, conveyed very effectively in that scene. We know that the um, uh, crossing of religions goes the other way, too, because Athelstan is, is kidnapped and he's brought back to the Viking village. And he and Ragnar, over the course of a long period, actually become friends. And he becomes intrigued by Viking religion. He learns about the gods and goddesses, learns the legends and stories, participates in the rituals, etc. In fact, he carries this uh, kind of bracelet, like, a, like an amulet, that's carved with the, his figures from Viking mythology. So the Vikings begin to think, oh, he's becoming one of us. In the meantime, Ragnar, the Viking king, is asking Athelstan about Christianity. And a very affecting scene. Um, Athelstan teaches the Our Father to Ragnar. So you see this, this theme of the, of the crossing of the religions. Now, now, lest you get the sense, this is all postmodern, let's all get along, aren't we all saying the same thing deep down? Liberalism, it's not, because 
the characters in the show care deeply about who's right religiously. They care deeply about which one of these systems is correct. And in fact, Athelstan, after a kind of dalliance with the Viking religion, comes massively back to his Christian faith. So it's very interesting to me to watch how central religion uh, was to these people and also how central the question of who's right religiously. I mean, we tend to say today, what? Oh, who cares? Or it's up to you. It's a private matter. <clears throat> you got yours. I got mine. Mm, uh, prior to modern times or even postmodern times, people were deeply interested in the questions of religion and which religion is right. That comes through in this uh, story. Another figure that intrigues me, Ragnar's brother called Rollo, um, at one point, purely cynical political reasons, agrees to be baptized. They're just trying to kind of get in with the Christians to undermine them. So Rollo is, in fact, baptized by the bishop. And he takes it kind of as a joke. Nevertheless, it has an impact on him. The, the baptism has affected something in him. And it, said, it spoke to me of that objectivity of the sacraments. They're not just a matter of nice symbols of <clears throat> subjective disposition, but they, are, uh, they affect something objectively. That comes through. Just a last thing, and also with, with Rolo in mind. Um, so Rolo, who's baptized, and the historical figure upon whom he's based, in fact, became a, a believing Christian. And after the uh, uh, invasion of France and all that, he's given or he takes the territory in the northwest part of present-day France, which comes to be called Normandy because it's the land of the Northmen. And Rollo is, in fact, the ancestor of William the Conqueror who eventually leaves Normandy to conquer England and becomes the source, if you want, of the whole tradition of the British uh, royalty. His very distant descendant, Henry VIII, is called a defender of the faith by the Pope, and the British monarchs to the present day carry that title, defender of the faith. Well, what I find so fascinating is, here's this figure who was originally a Viking, <clears throat> a non-believer, but becomes a Christian, and in fact, the fountainhead of, of the Christianity of England to the present day. What it shows is the extraordinary power of assimilation that Christianity at its best has always had, that they could take in this Viking uh, figure with his, his beliefs and so on and, and baptize them appropriately so that he becomes a prominent and important Christian figure. Anyway, for all these reasons, I think it's true what my young colleague said. This is the most religious show on TV. So I would say, if you're a little tired of the dreary secularism that's in so much of uh, TV and movies today, take some time and watch Vikings. 